It's time! Episode 2, 2023, ATM Apologise to Me. Mark Watson joining me, Martin Devlin here on the platform. We're going to be talking about these insane changes being made to the rules of rugby that are going to affect every single aspect of the way the game is played. The, the game that we used to know will no longer be that game. More rugby with the sevens. Will it ever come back here? Forget the platitudes from New Zealand rugby. It never will. We'll talk about the EPL. What do you believe in Arsenal? Everton have sacked their manager Frank Lampard today. No flags beside a player's name at the Australian Open. Well, that's just a protest which is stopping the war in the Ukraine, isn't it? I mean, what is the point of that? The Warriors season and Brayden Curry, who we spoke to yesterday, thanks to you, Mark, the hurt locker, blood in the urine, all of that, the toughest, most determined athlete we have in the country. Apologise to me! First up, though, the new rugby tackle law, July the 1st, it gets introduced into England across the board, apart from Premiership and Championship, below the waist. Once again, World Rugby are morons, aren't they? Where's the consultation? Where's the science on this? Where is the pra- practicality about how this is actually going to be enforced? Oh, more virtue signalling, more PowerPoint presentation bullshit, to be honest, Martin. Uh, I mean, honestly, the game's just going to be red card, yellow card, red card, yellow card. Um, yeah, look, unfortunately, it's just not played in slow motion. It's not a game that um, where players can simply have the time to line themselves up and get everything perfectly in time and perfectly in balance. Look, there are issues surrounding concussion, but dumbing the game down to this level is not the answer, Martin. It's not going to encourage more kids and parents to want to play the game. And look, it's starting to look, you know, more and more, isn't it, a little bit like NFL. It won't be too long before we get the helmets. It won't be too long before, you know, we've got offensive, defensive lines who have mastered this ability to tackle low. And look, I, I think rugby is just in real trouble. We've said about rugby being in real trouble in this country. I, I just think, don't think there's any way back here. I, I really don't in terms of spectator numbers, interest in the game. And this is just the game, just stupidity at its finest, uh, um, again, virtue signalling, trying to appease a minority, and I'm not sure who that minority is, Martin, but yeah, you do just shake your head how these people get into these positions and then somehow think they're actually doing the right thing. It's a man's game. It's a gladiatorial game. It's always been tough. Go back to the origins of it. Um, You know, it was for so long, for 100 and what, 30 odd years, Martin, we've never had any issues. All of this stuff has risen, come of age in the last four or five years because of maybe one or two incidents. And then what we do, hey, let's go and legislate it. Let's just make it look like a completely and utterly different game. Uh, You know, it won't be too long before we bring it into play because we have to be seen to do the right thing. Yeah, and, and, uh, you know... What is the right thing? Obviously, protecting the head is the right thing. We all know that. Rugby was played, though, has been played for, well, ever since Webb Ellis picked the ball up and ran with it. Not that English rugby have actually (laughs) seen that, figured it out, and thought that's actually the way you do play the game. You pin your ears back. But ever since rugby has been played, uh, you know... Tackling has 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 been obviously an essential part of it. What this is actually doing to me is removing that aspect from the game. If you just tackle around the legs, how do you explain to me? How do you how does a rolling maul work then? I mean, how do you actually stop that? What is everyone now able to offload? So that means if you do tackle somebody, they're just going to offload the ball. So what does that mean? Instead of tackling them, we're just going to shepherd them, are we? Like in the NFL, it's just ridiculous, mate. It's just not practical. Well, and how does a referee in a club game? What's he going to do from thirty? yards away what is he gonna hang on a second hang on a second i think that was above the stern mate you're just you're you're killing it for all the right reasons but you're doing it in completely the wrong way oh look you know i understand hey if you go around the head you go around the shoulders the way it's always been around the head it's a head high you get sent off you get a yellow card it's always been that way but you think about in and around the tight view or a loose forward you pick and go up the middle and a guy makes a tackle he gets to his feet and suddenly there's another one coming at him and he just decides to step out of the way because if he doesn't, the only form of him actually being able to tackle this guy was to be able to wrap his arms around this guy's shoulders almost in a bear hug and sort of pull him forward. Or that's deemed high. I don't want a yellow card. I don't want a red card. Hey, let's just open the door. Off you go. I I mean, you know, the game, it's intuitive. It's instinctive. It's sometimes, um, you know, it's just a natural reaction, isn't it, to to, want to make the tackle. 
you know, the athleticism and the finesse that's going to be required for a player in and around the fringes, the number six, the seven, those guys that are just tackling machines to be able to get to their feet, to get back into that low position. It's just dumb, dumb, dumb stuff. It's about as dumb, Martin. It's about as dumb as New Zealand rugby statement about Oh, we're going to try and bring seven oh, back stop to New it, Zealand. I mean, for God's sake, we're, thank we're, God, we're, there's one other person in this goddamn here. world, and that is you that knows. When you listen to Chris Lindrum talk about this, mate, it's just words and platitudes. I mean, okay, let me let me spell this out for everyone, okay? And it's a great topic that you bring up. New Zealand rugby at the seven saying, oh, what a great tournament, and Lindrum, the professional manager of what New Zealand rugby, whatever this title is, walking around, oh, my God, we're so committed to this. When are you committed to it? Okay, so there's a Commonwealth Games every two years, and Olympic Games in between. Okay, you're not playing it in those years. You're not inviting teams over. So when Super Rugby's being played, no, you can't play it then. While the circuit's around the world, the World 7 circuit, you can't fit it in then. Then there's the international window in July. You can't play it then. Obviously, the NPC starts, so it can't be played then because players are actually committed to other things. And then the end of year two. When exactly are you going to pay to get teams over here? Who's going to watch it? For a start, well, you've got so much rugby on at the moment, you're going to get 20,000 people turning up to watch New Zealand play Fiji in the Sevens at Eden Park. Stop this. Why do New Zealand rugby constantly come out with these statements and this just PR schmuck guff and expect us to believe it? Because we have a media who will write it up, we'll have a Sky Television and a bunch of PR who will actually confirm it and actually buy into it and print a lovely little fluffy story. But it reminds me a little bit of O.J. Simpson, you know, when O.J. Simpson was found not gu- guilty of um, killing his ex-girlfriend. And then he said, look, I'm going to spend the rest of my life looking for the real killer. Well, apparently the real killer was somewhere out on a golf course because that's ultimately where he spent the rest of his days playing golf, wasn't it? And yes, it's the same sort of thing here with New Zealand rugby. It is just a nice little way of just calming everybody down, everybody who's sad to see sevens go. But New Zealand rugby, they don't care. They don't care. The only thing no. New Zealand rugby deeply care about is the All Blacks. They deep down really don't care about women's rugby. They'll tell you that they do, but that's just another big inconvenience itself. And if you talk to people behind behind the scenes. They know this thing's never going to return anything financially for them, but they've got to do it. They've got to be seen to be doing the right thing. I mean, you go back to 2016, we had an Olympic Games on. We had an opportunity to win a medal. We had an opportunity in the first Olympics in the greatest era of all black rugby, and then suddenly we had a little bit of a U-turn with those players that had put their hand up initially and then suddenly pulled out because they wanted to play a series against Wales in June. I I mean, it's just absolute utter nonsense and crap. And seriously, if they have the level of resource to try and bring us sevens tournament here with zero credibility, and what are you playing for? It's not like there's any jeopardy on the line. If you've got that time and if you've got that level of resource, surely I think most New Zealanders would rather have you go and put it into club rugby go and put that resource into the NPC and get those forms of the game just a little bit stronger. I mean, I said it with the head high stuff. Rugby is dead and buried. I don't think we're ever going to get back to the heights we did. You know, we don't have our best players playing in Super Rugby. The Mitre 10 Cup, as we've said, is just a shadow of itself. When's it all going to change? When is suddenly there going to be this shift in the way New Zealanders do things? We've changed our habits and we're not going back. Sevens is dead, Super Rugby's dying, might have 10 Cup Rugby, well, it died years ago. The All Blacks are now saying once every four years, and these morons at the top still somehow think they're good at what they do. These morons at the top still think their governance is amazing. They're as arrogant as they can come. They've lived on 120 years. They've, they've got the Sky Television, who, who we've said, who are nothing but puppet masters. Oh, they are just basically. That's a PR, they are a PR company for New Zealand rugby is all they are, you, mate. That's all you they ask, are. You, could, you try and go and get a job within that organisation and you're not qualified. How do you mean I'm not qualified? It doesn't take a rocket scientist. It is university business 101. Look at the grass. Look at the trends. Everything. Everything is trending down. And yet these guys cannot see it. And they continue to push in an opposite direction of what people want, Martin. I am over it. I wish this media would actually get Mark Robertson. I wish this media would actually hold these clowns to account. Find out who these board of directors are. Never will, mate. And actually hold them to account. You know... You know, seriously, mate. I, I mean, honestly, I, I know we're going to talk about Braden Curry, and I heard your interview with him yesterday. But 
you pointed it out brilliantly. Look at these guys, mate. You don't hear them complaining. You know, we've got rugby players in this country and women's rugby players who play about 10 games a year telling us they need to be paid. It's all about them now. It's all about the players. Meanwhile, the game is dying. You've got other athletes out there just doing it because they want to do it, Martin. Bring back those days. But that's just No, it's well gone, thinking, mate. It's mate. sadly well gone. Apologise to me! A couple of topics before we finish on, and yeah, Braden Curry, I do want to talk about. So I'm watching a lot of the Aussie Open at the moment. I think the fifth set tiebreaker is one of the most beautiful things in sport. I can't sit through four and a half hours of, of whack, whack, thrash, back, Kenneth. I can't. But when it comes to the tiebreak, I love it. But I was watching a game last night, Rublev playing Rune, and Rublev's one of these players on the tour who... His flag is blank. There is no flag there because obviously he's Russian or he's Belarusian. How pathetic is this? I mean, what what is the point of it? What's it actually doing? What's it actually signaling? It's, it's nothing. It doesn't do anything. It's embarrassing for everyone concerned. If you don't want the guy or the girl playing at the tournament, then have some balls and ban them from the tournament. But to put a blank flag next to their name, I mean, mate, it's just cringeworthy, isn't it? Again, it's just virtue signaling. Oh, look, absolutely. No different than the Australian soccer team. No different than the Australian netball team. They don't really mean it. The organisers, yeah, they know they're going to get a little bit of a, a pick up here. I mean, it's like at the Olympic Games when you've got all these athletes out of Russia that have been given um, the go-ahead to compete and they compete under the flag, I think, of ROC. And you're sitting there as a commentator. What the hell does that mean? Yeah, what Russian Olympic Committee. Yeah. Mm. I, 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 I mean, look, is this sort of like... You know, are they are they about to take over? Um, are they about to go and take over Palestine again and create another independent state like what we've got now with Israel? I mean, it is just absolutely, utterly stupid. If you genuinely don't, if you genuinely think there is an issue here, like you said, Martin, say no Russians, no Belarusians. I'm sorry. We're not going to allow you to compete. We're going to take a stance here. But then you go, well, hang on a minute. What about America's yeah, foreign that's policy? Right. Do, yeah, we start yeah. a, do we start banning the Americans for all their illegal wars? Oh, that's right. We can justify those. They're saying it's in the best interest of democracy. Well, Russia, you could argue, or you uh, uh, have invaded uh, the Ukraine because they believe it's in the best interest of the Russian people. We, I don't want to get into that political debate. What about the Chinese and the way they've treated the, uh, uh, the, the Uyghur minority over there and the, the racial cleansing that's going on? Are, are you going to decide to ban them and have them compete under a different flag? Or are you just going to jump on the bandwagon? Yeah, it's all it is, mate. Yeah, who don't understand the is. wider issue here. And all it is, all it is, is just sort of populist, virtue signalling BS, Martin. All right, let's talk about Braden Curry then. I was going to talk about the Tua Tata. We'll do that next week. They're having a hell of a season. I was going to ask you about the Warriors season. We'll save that as well. I want to talk about Braden Curry. Hey, 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 just quickly on the Warriors season. There is no season. Oh, come on, mate. Don't be be like that, mate. Come on, mate. It's the the beginning of the season. It's the only bloody time we can say it is our year, mate. Come on. Cut us some slack, Rob. Where are we going? Where are we going? Sean Johnson's the answer, mate. Sean's fit. He's in training. He's got a great attitude. It's all happening. Oh, and he's on the cover of Women's Day. When are we going to learn, Martin? It's like people that think they can beat the house not realising that Las Vegas wasn't built on winners, Martin. Let's talk about (laughs) Braden Curry, (laughs) shall we? I want to talk about the Hurt Locker. I want to talk about bleeding out the eyeballs. I want to talk about a man that you described to me, and I've been repeating this as nauseam, as the single-minded, most single-minded, toughest, determined athlete in this country. Four coast to coast. A couple of New Zealand Ironmans. Led the World Ironman Championships uh, with 10 minutes to go and lost it in the last 100 metres. And yak into this guy yesterday, the most humble dude. So he comes off the half, mar- uh, half Ironman on the weekend at Tauranga. He doesn't take a sabbatical. He doesn't need to tell anyone how tired he is, Mark. And I'm... I'm, I'm I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sounding like you now. He's training again. He goes over to Tasmania and then back on the circuit. You know, these athletes never get the publicity they deserve, do they? And their attitude is everything as a New Zealand sports fan that we love. They are just gutsy. They are gritty. They go through hell and they come back. They, they, the mind games they play with themselves to stay out there on course. I'm not even talking about the physical fitness goddamn involved and how many hours that takes. I'm talking about a guy, I want him playing for the All Blacks because I know that when the going gets tough at a World Cup, he's not going to turn around and go, well, I never liked the coach anyway. I actually think I deserve new boots. How's my deal going over there? Are any pretty girls following on Instagram? The guy's just a hard ass, is what he is, Watto. 
Oh, look, 100%, and he follows in the footsteps of Cameron Brown, who was a different heart. I cannot un- describe just how tough those guys are, too. It's interesting. I remember when I was on Radio Sport, and I used to go after the cricketers a lot and criticise them quite heavily for maybe their um, off-field attitude and their lack of work ethic and stuff, and all the excuses that were thrown around why they didn't perform. And I remember a guy rang me up once, and he had a real crack at me. And I think Cameron Brown particularly had just, you know, maybe fallen outside of the top 10 at Hawaii or hadn't finished. And he said, why aren't you criticising him? And it was a really simple answer. I said, well, look, at the end of the day, he pays his way to the race. And if he doesn't perform, he doesn't get paid. And if Cameron Brown failed, it's not because he didn't do the work. It's probably because he was overtrained. And I think that, I think that's what a lot of people don't realise in this country. And I'll put our swimmers in there too. Our swimmers might not necessarily make it on the international stage, but boy, they do train hard. Um, you know, you look at it, you look at the cyclists out there that we're starting oh, to get yeah. on the world yeah. tour. Mm. These guys are as tough as they come. It's a lonely sport. It's day in, day out, six, seven hour days on the bike, rain, hail, or shine. A lot of it done by yourself. And then you do get the, the guys like the Braden Curries, you know, that when Edmund Hillary conquered Everest, I think he described it as I came around the corner and before I knew it, I'd knocked the bastard off. Yeah. You know, that sort of shield ride right yeah. attitude and yeah. that sort of really lax. And so when you get a guy like Braden Curry, I, I mean, I said this, is, I was down there, we had large crowds over the weekend. It's a big race in total. And I was saying this on the microphone and I sort of said it as a joke, but I meant it. I said, if you took this guy's heart and put it in the Warriors, would win the NRL everywhere. If you took this guy's heart and put it in the All Blacks, you would win the World Cup. What this guy does and the levels he pushes to is just, it, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, he plays it down. But you cannot describe the hurt this guy goes into and how long he can stay there and how much hurt he's prepared to put on somebody else in the name of trying to win. I mean, if you break him, you deserve to break him. And you've gone to a bloody, bloody dark place to do it. But, you know, it's funny, isn't it? The sports, they get all the media coverage. Oh, we've now got to pay our women cricketers because of life. I mean, they're club athletes, Martin. Let's not kid ourselves. What's required in terms of playing cricket is nothing, nothing compared to what's required to being a world-class Ironman or trying to make it in the sport of swimming. And In fact, Norma, former national swim coach, Mark Bone, who I do a lot of work with, he always used to say in training, if you don't, if you're mucking around, guys, if you if you want to muck around, if you don't if you don't want to train, go and play cricket. And, and I think there was a lot in that. And, and then you've got oh, now we've got the women's rugby players saying, oh, look how life tough it is. You know, we've got about four games of Super Rugby coming up. We've got about four games in the Farrah Palmer Cup, and we've got a couple of Test matches coming up. And the men get paid, so we should get paid. And all the media jumping up and down saying this is absolute disgrace. They don't. The same media who give none of these athletes any, any credit at all. The same media that ignore, you know, ignored the likes of the Erin Bakers coming through, the runners like Kimberly Smith. Where were they backing these up? Where were they just simply giving these athletes the coverage and some of the recognition that they deserve? I, I mean, Braden Curry is a throwback to what, you know, what we as New Zealanders love, that sort of she'll be right attitude. And yeah, it's really, really just grates me, grates me when... I hear the sob stories of our All Blacks. I hear the sob stories of our cricketers and stuff. And I'm like, get out, get real, go and watch these guys. You know, they're up at six o'clock in the morning doing 5K swim sessions. They're out on their bike riding six, seven hours a day. They're getting off and running. The next day it's a hard run workout, another hard swim, another bike. It is absolutely relentless, relentless. It's a weight-bearing sport. There's no 14 other people around you where even if you're having a bad day, you can sort of disguise your own performance. It's a lonely place. Iron Man, those events, those endurance events, they know no names, they know the socioeconomic backgrounds, racial creed. If you haven't done the work, you will get chewed up and you will get spat out and it is there for everybody to see. But oh no, oh no, no, nobody does it as tough as our rugby boys and nobody does it as tough as our cricketers and I don't get it and you don't get it. I don't get, get it, it no, I don't get it, no, I don't get it either, mate. They can't, no. play, they can't play super rugby because they're tired, mm, Martin. Tired, mate, yeah. That's what they've got to go up and they've got to go up and take a sabbatical in Japan and earn 10 times yeah. the money. Apologise to me! Coverage of the football ferns from the mass media, to me, I've described it as nauseating. I, I, I did an editorial piece on this, and it, it actually led the Yahoo Australia sports site. The only voice in New Zealand that is prepared to stand up and say the coverage of that team is 
patronizing and demeaning to the athletes. These women, I know that these young women don't want to go out there and be embarrassed and shellacked 5-0. And for the captain, afterwards, the coach, New Zealand football and everyone else to say, oh, what a great occasion it was and the sun was out and the crowd. Listen, listen, I don't mind if that's your attitude, but signal it beforehand. Stop trying to pretend that this is a competitive team. They've won one game in 21. They're going to get absolutely bummed at the World Cup and we all know that they're the most underperforming, over-resourced New Zealand sporting side. Six times the budget of the All Whites. They hand the coach a six-year contract. They never do nothing except fail at every world tournament they ever go to, Mark. And all we get from the mass New Zealand sports media is what a wonderful occasion it was. Now, look, I will separate it and say, hey, look, you and me are old. We don't understand the way that the youngies look at sport. You know, the young kids want autographs, rain, hail or shine, win, loss or draw. They don't care. I understand that. Do all of that. But stop trying to pretend that this is a goddamn competitive team when it it is clearly not. And stop telling us that the most important thing about this is the, the occasion and the event. The football women World Cup exists without the football ferns. Yes, it's been held here, but they are a nothing when it comes to world football. And either cover it with the with the same kind of attitude you cover the men's sport, with the same kind of critical analysis, or flag it as a promotional piece because that is all it goddamn is. Yeah, but see, this is the problem with these feminists. This is the problem with all of these people that sit on the left. They just want to cherry pick, don't they? They want they want equality, but only certain parts of equality. And, and you know, I used to, and I'm sure you did, but back in the days when we were on ZB and stuff, and people used to say to me and go, you don't really cover any women, but why aren't you giving the netball coverage? And I said, because the moment I criticise them, I'll have someone in the media the next day accusing me of being a chauvinist. You know, I'm aware that you've got to use words slightly different when it comes to weight. You can have a crack at the Warriors and just call them fat. Clearly, there are eating disorders and stuff, and there is certain language you do have to use in and around women's sport. And I used to have to sort of say, I don't think they look as fit as they could be. And I'm going, you know, and and so you've got to tiptoe delicately around the whole thing. But I get sick and tired of this. I mean, I heard, you know, I saw the Silver Ferns yesterday dropping eight points. And it's always, oh, yeah, but it's about the World Cup. Well, put that on your damn ticket. Development team playing. Thank you. Development team playing. Emerging team playing. Thank you. Happy, go lucky, all white, turning up. Hey, but isn't this just... Isn't this just symbolic of how far women have come and the great oppression against men and that, hey, historically, the only relationship between men and women has been one of dominance and now we've got a women's football team and we'll throw all the resource into them and they should get paid as well because, God, they do it tough, Martin, and people just don't get it. And how dare Chris would be earning so much and these girls aren't. But again, the moment they perform badly, you're not allowed to criticise no. them, are you? Oh, no. No. no, you're not allowed to call No, you're a sexist misogynist. Pig. Talk, that's right yeah yeah and talk and talk about the players that should be dropped and how this player here barely moved the entire game and they look disinterested we should be sacking the coach oh no my career is gone your career is gone but at the same time we want to be taken seriously martin you know meanwhile as we go you got the braden curries out the performing getting zero media coverage and if they perform they get no media coverage but you know new zealand football i you know this. I go down with my son. I cannot believe how many girls play this. So there is something fundamentally wrong with the way we are developing these kids at a certain age, with the coaching we've got put in place. But who's going to be held accountable? No one. Who's going to be Certainly held accountable? Certainly not New Zealand Nobody's football. Nobody's going no to be one. held accountable. No. Because no. what we're going to do is we're going to have a cast of thousands at Sky that are all going to be women, all going to be different ethnic backgrounds, like Ian Smith pointed out too, and it's just going to be one big la da little love fest. You know, forget playing the national anthem. Let's just sing old Lang Syne. Let's sing Kumbaya, my lord. Let's sit around the campfire and the campfire is burning and hold bloody hands, Martin. Because I'm like you. I am over it. You want to be taken seriously. Well, deal with the criticism. If you want me to turn up, start winning. And if you want people to turn up, target the women. But if I don't turn up, don't refer to me as a chauvinist. If I criticise you on radio, don't come after me and don't force me to quit my job because you go on some big, you know, some big left-wing rant how clearly I don't get it and how clearly I'm chauvinist. I mean, you know, I, I saw this article the other day when Jacinda Ardern steps down and the article was chauvinism well and truly alive. It's like, no, she... She was unpopular because of her policy. That's it. Helen Clark That's was it. actually popular yeah. because she was actually That's a good leader. Yeah, simple. Even though she sits politically on the other Called side. Called democracy. It's real the, simple. The people oh, are voting. No, what we've got to do. <laughs> What we've got to do is we've got to find excuse for their failings, for the great leaders' failings, and what do we do? We go back and we blame men for it, and we go back and we play the chauvinists, and we pull out all the different political bloody angles, Martin. I've had a guts full of it. Devlin. Have you seen my wiener? The Platform.